Good afternoon and welcome to Tetakawi's webinar, Should You Manufacture in Mexico? I'm David McQueen and I'll be your host this afternoon. Before we get started, just a couple of points. Uh, we expect to have a lot of participants today, so uh, we will not likely be able to answer any live questions. However, you do have an opportunity of, by pushing the Q&A button to send questions to my colleague, Ricardo Rascon, who's online. Uh, we'll try and answer as many as we can at the end. Uh, but the ones we don't get to, we'll try and get back to you uh, by email or um, uh, through some other messaging. Uh, so please ask whatever questions you want using that Q&A button as we go along. Uh, you'll also get a copy of the presentation or recording, uh, and it, it will contain my uh, contact information uh, so you can get a hold of us and, and ask questions at a later date, too, after you've thought about things. So let's get started. First of all, um, I'd like to uh, tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is David McQueen, as I said. I'm a management consultant. I've been working with Teta Cowie uh, since 2012. Uh, but I have over 40 years of manufacturing experience, and most of that has been spent at senior executive levels. Uh, during that time, I had some international experience, and that included planning and launching two Mexican operations. Uh, so I've had some experience uh, sitting where some of you are sitting today, trying to figure out whether it's a good idea to go to Mexico or not, and then figuring out how to make it happen. A little bit about who Teta Cowie is. Uh, we are a shelter service company headquartered in Tucson, Arizona, an American company. Shelter companies are a unique kind of uh, Mexican company, and I'll explain a little bit more about that later. Uh, but uh, the main, main part of our business is providing um, outsourced services in both administration and facilities for foreign companies that are setting up operations in Mexico. We also provide a unique kind of legal umbrella and that's what I'll explain a bit more about as we go along. Uh, we're the largest. We currently employ over 24,000 people, the majority of them in Mexico and the majority of them working under the direction of our clients. We have over 5 million square feet of industrial space that we own and manage directly. We also have clients working in third party real estate. And we're currently supporting 75 companies with their ongoing operations in Mexico as we speak. Down below, you'll see three of our sister companies uh, that have some bearing on what we're gonna talk about. ILS is a uh, logistics and freight third-party uh, logistics company. Uh, they give us a window on that industry. Uh, Denise's property development and real estate, so that keeps us uh, with a, a pretty strong um, understanding of that part of the Mexican market. And Intugo is the brand name we use when we're marketing our um, services to office-based activities. So Teta Cowie focuses on manufacturing factory-based clients in Mexico. Intugo uh, has a slightly different model doing the same kind of thing for people that are office-based. So what we're going to do today is we're going to follow an imaginary company that I've called Art Design. Uh, and we're going to track that company as they consider whether Mexico is a good option for them and then do some preliminary evaluation of where they want to be, what they want to do there, and, and how much it might cost. So uh, let, let's meet Art Design as a starting point. Uh, as I said, it's an imaginary company, but all of the data we've used to create this model has been drawn from real client experience and real client data from our client base. So everything you're seeing is real. We've just tried to uh, make sure we don't um, tell any secrets that we shouldn't be telling. Uh, so uh, Art Design is, is a, an American company that has uh, been in business since the 70s. Uh, they've developed a pretty strong product line of, of lighting products. Uh, and they currently manufacture, design, and import lighting products and distribute them through the American market. <clears throat> they currently have 300 employees. Uh, they design and market products in, from an office in Los Angeles. But in addition, they have factories and distribution centers in California, Illinois, and Tennessee, in each case near major centers, Los Angeles, Chicago, and Memphis. Uh, so uh, they assemble the high-end, low-volume products in the United States, and that keeps them in the manufacturing uh, business. They have an understanding of it, and, the, and some of their employees are employed in manufacturing. But... Starting in the 1990s, they began sourcing in China as a low-cost partnership. Uh, eventually, they developed what was initially just raw materials and components into finished product ready for sale to the end customer. And as that happened, their manufacturing operations in, in the United States decreased in size, didn't disappear, but they decreased, 
and their overall employee headcount decreased while their business, in fact, grew. The processes that go into their products include metal forming, injection molding for plastics, electronics assembly, and decorating processes like painting, anodizing, and plating, the kinds of things you'd expect for home lighting. Now, art design is, is facing a number of serious challenges, and they think Mexico may be a solution to those challenges. Some of these may be the same challenges you're facing, some of them may be different. First and foremost is the rising manufacturing cost in China. When they first started to source from China, the gap between China and their competitors in low cost regions, as well as their gap with the United States was quite significant. It's not so significant anymore. Uh, inflation has been uh, steadily increasing the cost in China. And in fact, today, the direct labor cost to source in China is higher than it is in Mexico. So our design is motivated to look at Mexico as an alternative because not only does it look like basic costs are lower, it also, of course, eliminates a, a transportation cost associated with China. Second big factor is trade barriers and the disruption associated with them. And certainly, as we all know, the current administration has uh, made it a focus of their, their trade um, tactics to target China. Uh, sometimes these, uh, the actions have been uh, rather abruptly implemented, and that causes disruption. There's also uncertainty about where things are going in the future. And uh, by, by all accounts, it doesn't look like, even if the administration changes, that the Democrats will follow a, a markedly different course. They may have different methods, different motivations, but it doesn't look likely that China is going to be out of the, the trade um, target zone anytime soon. So Art Design is looking for some alternatives that are, that are less sensitive to the disruption associated with China. Another issue for them, and this is more of a longer term issue, but it's becoming serious, is labor shortages in the aging US workforce. Now the core of their operation is those 300 people in the United States who understand how to make lighting, design lighting, engineer lighting, and market it to the American market. And that workforce is aging. And at the same time, of course, um, um, in the United States, manufacturing, especially traditional types of manufacturing, are not considered very attractive career uh, courses or career directions for young people. So it, it's difficult to attract people. Now, currently with COVID, there's some economic uh, uh, decline and, and uh, it's not as difficult to hire people, but they remember what it was like before the COVID restrictions and it has been getting progressively difficult to, to hire and develop talented people who can succeed those that are retiring. And one of the attractions for them in Mexico is that it's a completely different situation there. Mexico has a very young workforce. The average age is in the high 20s. Uh, they are also graduating significant numbers of engineering and business graduates from their universities. And most of these people still see manufacturing as a very attractive career path. And in addition, they see working for an American company as a way to develop that skill set as very attractive. So they see more opportunity than they see in China or the United States to develop the kinds of resources they're going to need in the next 10 to 20 years. Customer demands are a factor. Uh, there's some pressure from people like Home Depot and Lowe's who they deal with to uh, source demand locally in order to, to um, improve turnaround times, reduce costs. Uh, that's, that's not new. Uh, that's always been there, but Mexico might solve some of those problems. But in addition to that, art design has looked at the Mexican market and they see two key opportunities. First of all, Mexico has a growing middle class that's not only growing in size, but affluence. And so there's an opportunity to sell into that market, um, which would be enhanced by local supply. But another thing is that in Mexico, not only are they part of the USMCA, which is the North American Trade Agreement that succeeded NAFTA, they also have more free trade agreements than any other country in the world. So there's an opportunity in Mexico to consider exporting to other Latin American countries, to Europe. Uh, the possibilities are, are pretty widespread. So that's something they cannot do from the United States without facing trade barriers, and it might allow them to expand their, their business. And lastly, they're tiring of the cost and, and challenges of managing the Asian supply chain. Back when there was a huge price graph, gap between Asia and, and the United States, uh, the fact that you needed to carry significant inventory, the fact that there were long delivery cycle times, the fact that it was a different time zone 12 hours away, 
uh, the fact that it was difficult to get there, all of those things were bearable because there was such a significant savings. But now Art Design's in a situation where all of those things are just an additional hassles to doing business. They'd like to have a partner who's in the same time zone, who's two or three hours away by plane instead of 12 hours away, uh, and where the cultural and political similarities are much closer to the United States and they have less to worry about there. So all of these factors together make uh, Mexico an attractive alternative and art design would like to consider whether that makes sense from a cost basis. But before they do that, they have to think of how they're gonna get into Mexico. What are the rules there? What are the laws? Well, first of all, as a general thing, Mexico has a very open business culture. They're open to foreign investment. There are very few restrictions on foreign investors. Um, and consequently, all of the kinds of things that Mexican companies can do are, are open typically to foreign companies as well. Now, the first thing that Art Design would like to do is subcontract because that's what they do in China. It would be simply a matter of moving their business to a different client. They control the design and engineering so they could do that. Um, but, but there's a couple of problems with that. First of all, in Mexico, the subcontracting market developed differently than it did in China. In China, a lot of state-owned enterprises were devolved into smaller entrepreneurial units, and the government encouraged entrepreneurial activity and companies to seek export business and, and get into things like subcontracting and contract manufacturing. In Mexico, mainly because of the proximity to the United States, when they started to open their economy, they looked to foreign investment and to making it easy for foreign companies to set up subsidiaries and manufacturing in Mexico. And as a consequence, the entrepreneurial activity in Mexico and the existence of, of subcontractors and contract manufacturers is far more limited. In some industries it exists, there's, there's subcontractors will make TVs for you, there's subcontractors will make computers for you, electronics, it's fairly common. And in some other industries, clothing, for example, but but in, in the sector of the economy that, that um, Art Design's working in, they don't think it's gonna be very easy to find anyone who can make a finished product. And that means they'll have to do some level of manufacturing themselves. So the next thing they think about is joint venture or acquisition. Wide open in Mexico, you can acquire as many companies as you want. You can have a joint venture if you want in any proportion you'd like to set up. So those options are open. Uh, however, as is the case in, in most cases with acquisition and joint venture in any country, uh, the existence of targets is, is a bit uh, questionable. So whether they're actually going to find somebody to partner with, maybe not. So what Art Design decides is that for now, if something falls into their lap or they hear of an opportunity, yes, this might be an avenue. They would get an immediate footprint, they'd get some skilled people, be great. But the likelihood of finding it is low, so that's not going to be a core strategy for them. So that leaves them with setting up their own operation. And one way they can do it is just as they can in the United States, they can incorporate their own company, their own subsidiary in Mexico, and they could set up an operation. Uh, the, the incorporation options are very similar to the United States. Uh, there is uh, in Mexico more of a tendency to define the purpose of a company. Uh, and consequently, you may need two or three corporations to accomplish what you want to do, but the cost of setting up a corporation is, is relatively low and it's very straightforward. Uh, so incorporation is certainly an option, but there's a unique option in Mexico. When Mexico started opening their company, their, uh, their economy, they created the shelter option. And what they realized was that foreign companies might be intimidated by the legal, regulatory and cultural hurdles of setting up an operation in Mexico when they first came there. So they created an opportunity for them to contract with a shelter company that was registered with the government. And in that case, the Mexican government would hold the shelter provider responsible for legal and regulatory compliance. In turn, the shelter provider would perform certain administrative tasks, which would relieve the, the foreign company of learning how to do those tasks when they were launching their operation. Now, it has since expanded to where shelter companies not only provide that legal umbrella, which prevents the foreign company from being exposed to liability, but they also have a wide range of administrative and facility services that allow a company to enter Mexico and not have to immediately earn, or in fact, maybe never learn, the, the intricacies of administering and operating a company from the administrative end in Mexico. Instead, they control their operation, and they control their manufacturing, but they don't have to deal with creating the administrative infrastructure. 
So in the case of Art Design, they certainly decide to start this way. Uh, they know that if they want to migrate out of the shelter at any point, that can be done. That you don't, you're not obligated to stay in a shelter if you start that way. Later on, they can incorporate their own company if they like. But it, it takes away a lot of the risk. And in addition, because they're going to start relatively small and are a relatively small company to start with, it lowers a lot of the cost. The shelter providers typically have thousands of people that they're spreading the cost over instead of hundreds or, or tens of twenties. Uh, and consequently, they can gain critical mass and leverage costs to provide savings, net savings to their clients. So I, I want to just briefly explain how the shelter legal entity actually works because it's an unusual situation. You have a company like Art Design, which it must be a foreign company. Mexican companies aren't allowed to do this. Uh, you have the shelter company, which in our case, we're an American company, but not all shelter companies are. A contract gets formed between Art Design and, and the shelter company. And that contract is, in our case, litigated in the United States. So it's a subject to U.S litigation. If there were ever any litigation, it's a U.S. contract. Uh, but if you were dealing with a Mexican entity, a Mexican shelter company, it would be a Mexican contract. And that contract defines what the shelter company will do, follow the instructions of art design, provide them with the administrative services, provide them with the, the umbrella against liability. It also, of course, uh, stipulates what art design will pay for that. The shelter company then has a, a special entity in Mexico, which provides the shelter services and complies with the legal requirements of the Mexican government for the shelter operation itself. That company is an EMEX entity. EMEX is another program for exporters and, and foreign companies. It's also open to Mexican companies. Essentially, the purpose of EMEX is to allow exporters to avoid the value added tax, which is called EBA, IBA. Uh, but EMEX is unique in that um, the exports do not need to be external to Mexico. So a company that is uh, exporting to another EMEX company or importing goods from another EMEX company can do so within Mexico. And in fact, a lot of the business is conducted that way with companies shipping goods to and from each other in Mexico that will ultimately be part of an export production run. So uh, shelter companies offer that. You can also set up your own EMEX incorporation as well. The Mexican government, as I mentioned, is going to hold the shelter company accountable for legal and regulatory compliance and not art design. And once this is all in place, art design can set up their own operating unit in Mexico. And that unit will be under their control. It will look just like a subsidiary anywhere else that they might set up in the world. Uh, their policies, their culture, uh, their signage, their whatever, uh, but it, it will not exist as far as the Mexican government's concerned. That's the only difference. If they ever decide to create a corporation, they'll use that same entity and just simply incorporate it and no longer be a shelter. Art Design then will direct the shelter company to provide the services that they've agreed that the shelter company should provide, as well as the legal services that they can't be complied uh, with by Art Design's unit because they're not a legal entity. So, for example, Art Design wants to hire somebody. Uh, the shelter company will probably provide some recruiting services to find people. Art Design decides who they want and what they want to pay. They direct the shelter company to do the legal steps required to actually hire that person, pay that person, withhold their taxes, and all those kinds of things. So this looks pretty good so far to Art Design. Now they've got to come up with a plan. Uh, now, in their case, they're going to, going to spread their startup over three phases. Uh, and during that time, they, they figured that a 35,000 square foot factory will, will serve their both their manufacturing and their distribution needs because they're going to run with additional shifts as they go. So they start off in phase one with just a few people, 21 heads, some indirect and salary people. They, they use it, their existing supply chain so that they don't have to deal with that. Uh, with switching that supply chain. And what they're going to do is, is start some final assembly in, in Mexico to get going on a single shift. Once that's up and running and they're comfortable, they're going to double their size roughly by adding uh, more people to direct labor, a few more indirect and salary, still going to keep their existing supply chain, uh, but they're going to start moving China sourced finished goods to Mexico. Once they've moved all that finished product, that finished existing product to Mexico, they figure they'll be ready for their third phase. They'll increase their headcount to 72, add some more indirect and salary, but, and they're going to, but at this point, they'll start sourcing some uh, of their supply chain locally, and they'll start introducing new products, and essentially then they'll be up and running. So 
the next step for them is where do they want to be? In order to develop costing, you've got to know where you're going in Mexico. There is enough of a difference between different regions, uh, both in terms of manpower costs and in terms of, of things like logistics, which are obvious, uh, that it's important to make some decisions on, on the areas where you want to go. So what they do is they look at the four prime regions in Mexico. Now, there are more than this. But broadly, these four regions in the north of Mexico have most of the manufacturing that occurs there. The first one's the border zone. Uh, it's the places like Ciudad Juarez and uh, Tijuana and a bunch of other cities along the border. And, and of course, the chief advantage is they're right on the border with the United States. The disadvantages typically with border towns is that turnover tends to be higher and costs tend to be higher. Another alternative is Sonora. Uh, Sonora is a more recently industrialized part of the country. Uh, it's close to the United States. Typically from Hermosillo, you're looking at four or five hours to the Arizona border, so not too far. Uh, because it's more recently industrialized, it, it has a lower level of skill and services in the industrial sector than some other regions, but still not insignificant. And the big attraction of Sonora is that the costs tend to be a little lower. The Northeast includes places like Chihuahua, and uh, Monterrey, Saltillo, Torreon. Uh, this area of Mexico has been industrialized for a long time. In fact, Monterrey is the oldest industrialized area in Mexico. And uh, it therefore has a high level of services, high level of skill, a lot of uh, people available for manufacturers to hire and, and develop their business around. It's close to the United States. Um, Monterrey, about three hours drive to the border um, by car or by truck. Uh, so pretty close, uh, but the, it's far enough away that the costs are lower and the turnover is, is more manageable. And finally, they look at the Bajio. Now, this is a, a recent uh, area of Mexico to industrialize, but it has industrialized significantly and rapidly. So the service level in terms of industrial services and the level of skills in the people are pretty high, uh, not quite to the level of the Northeast, but, but, uh, but higher than the state of Sonora. Uh, and uh, costs have, uh, are comparable to the Northeast, uh, but a uh, big drawback is the distance to the U.S. border. On the other hand, if you're looking at the Mexican market, it's right in the heart of the Mexican market. So the population area, the, the um, largest population area in Mexico is around the Bajio area. Mexico City is, is just to the south of that. Guadalajara is, is on the east, uh, the western edge of it. So you're, you're talking about a large population area. So for Mexican market point of view, it's a very good location to do business. So these are the four reasons they look at. They like being in a major center, so they're going to choose four cities to drill down on. Tijuana in the, um, in the border zone. Uh, Tijuana is a natural for them because they have some operations in California, so close. Uh, sure enough, high skill levels, high levels of industrial services, obviously right on the border. But the costs are significantly higher, and, and uh, that's a deterrent. A bigger deterrent for art design, though, is the turnover. 13% per month on average. Many of their positions require some skills training in order to be efficient. They don't want to be going through that all the time with a, with a high turnover rate and, and recruiting difficulties. And if we remember earlier, they want to develop some long-term personnel skills. Uh, that's going to be much harder if the turnover is high. So they decide Tijuana doesn't make a lot of sense. It's also really far from their eastern markets. Next, they look at Hermosillo. Sure enough, the costs are lower. Uh, there are lower skill levels, but probably manageable for them. Turnover is better, uh, but they don't see enough advantage there to, to offset the, uh, any of the, the um, uh, advantages of any of the other areas. So Hermosillo is not the one they choose. They look at Quedetro next. Looks really attractive. The growing workforce is one of the few areas in Mexico where unskilled people actually are migrating into the area. That's uncommon in Mexico. Um, for skilled people to migrate, yes, but, but uh, unskilled people typically stay where they are. So Quedetro is an exception. That means they have really low turnover. The cost is moderate, higher than Hermosillo, but, but lower than Tijuana. It's in the heart of Mexico, but it's pretty far from the U.S. border. So uh, they end up looking at Saltillo last. It's in the northeast. High skill levels, again, higher than, than any of the areas except Tijuana. It's close to Texas, a uh, three, four-hour drive, moderate cost, um, comparable to Quedetro, lower than Tijuana, but higher than Hermosillo. Uh, and turnover is manageable. It doesn't have the in, influx of workers that Quedetro does, but the turnover looks manageable. 
So they decide that they're going to go for Saltillo. Now, for other people, maybe a different decision. But for, for art design, this is where they're going to focus in and do their costing. So before we get into some detail uh, on costing, I want to talk generally about costs in Mexico, uh, just to give you a little background. Now, we're going to focus only on, on factory costs. Obviously, raw materials are different for everybody, uh, and each, each person probably knows better how to source their, and cost their own raw materials. And I'm not going to deal with the SG&A uh, costs because uh, those costs are, uh, in the case of a shelter provider, it's just simply a matter of choosing who you want and getting some costing from them. But in the case of setting up your own, um, uh, your own operation, that's another exercise. The heart of where the savings are is usually in the factory costs, and that's what we're going to talk about today. So first thing to know is that in Mexico, labor law is federal. It's the same everywhere. So the comments that I make about, about labor law and pay scales and so on, uh, they apply everywhere in Mexico. It's the same, same regime. Uh, secondly, Mexico, Mexican labor law is based on a pay scale defined in pesos per day. So you have a rate, in this case, unskilled worker at 265 pesos per day. That rate uh, is also paid to that employee on 52 Sundays in the year. It's paid to the employee for seven statutory holidays. It's paid for the employee in the example we've got here, eight vacation days. Of course, vacation varies with seniority, but in the example, I've chosen eight. And then that's going to leave 298 working days. And in balance, the employer is going to pay 265 pesos per day times 365 days. In return, the law defines how many hours that employee must work for the employer when they're not on vacation or a stat holiday. And that depends on the start finish times. Employers can set those times wherever they like. So it's up to the employer what, what uh, shift schedule they work. But depending on the start finish times, that employee will be obligated for a certain number of hours per, per week before the overtime requirement kicks in. So if they start 6 a.m. or later and finish before 8 p.m., They'll, they're day shift employees, they will work 48 hours per week. If they start after 8 p.m. and finish before 6 a.m., they're night shift workers, 42 hours per week. And then there's an overlapping shift, which is called mixed shift in, in Mexico, but which we probably think of as afternoon shift. That's 45 hours per week. There's an additional restriction on the mixed shift, and that is it can't have more than three hours of night shift time or it becomes a night shift. So within those parameters, the employer can set whatever schedule they want and they know how many hours a week they can expect from that employee. Outside those hours, overtime applies. Overtime is rather expensive in Mexico. Uh, the base overtime starts at double time. That's a federal law. So after regularly scheduled shift hours, that employee is entitled to double time, whether they work their full 48 hours or 42 or whatever yet, it's the schedule that the employer sets that defines the overtime. And then beyond that, Sundays and holidays are triple time, but you also pay triple time if an employee works more than three overtime hours in one day or more than nine hours in total at double time in a week. So it's important to keep be conscious of those rules and to manage overtime carefully. Uh, in most fringe benefits will also double and triple. Some company paid benefits won't, but for most other fringe benefits, will. Some other statutory benefits that the law defines, vacation, as I mentioned, it's, uh, it varies with uh, seniority, but it starts at six days after the first year and then, then rises thereafter. In addition to those paid days off, there's a requirement for a vacation bonus, uh, which must be at least 25% of the vacation entitlement. So this, a person with six days would, would be entitled to an additional one and a half days pay uh, over and above the, the days that they're actually uh, paid to be off. It, for eight days, it would be two and so on. The Christmas bonus is also mandatory. It, it must be at least 15 additional days pay after the 365 you've already paid. Uh, both the Christmas bonus and the vacation bonus are often negotiated to be higher by unions or by employees when they're negotiating their employment deal. So it's common for employers, uh, particularly in certain markets, to pay more for both the vacation bonus and the Christmas bonus than the legal minimum. Uh, profit sharing is mandatory in Mexico. It's 10% of, of taxable income, and it's distributed to pretty well all employees. There's a formula which uh, defines uh, the way that it's shared. Half of it is shared on the basis of seniority. Half of it is shared on the basis of income. 
Uh, so uh, it, it, you distribute it according to the law. And uh, the employers who try to avoid it by trying not to have taxable income generally find themselves in difficulties with their employees because employees expect the profit sharing to be at some level um, a part of their pay package. So it's unlikely, it's particularly unlikely with a union that you're going to get away with uh, without paying profit sharing, but it's also a problem with, with other employees who know they're entitled to it. Um, sometimes it is possible to negotiate with the employees or the union to have a flat amount each year in lieu of an actual calculation. Uh, and if, if that's equitable and, and agreed by everyone, then, then that can be an alternative in some cases. Uh, in addition to the, the government requirements and, and uh, government fringes, uh, as in most economies, there are some fringe benefits provided by employers in order to be an employer of choice and in order to attract people to their company and compete with other companies. And uh, what you're looking at here is uh, the results of some field surveys that we did a couple of years ago uh, in, uh, in a variety of markets to compare company benefits, both in terms of how many people had them, but we also asked the question about which ones the workers themselves valued the most. Now, I'm not going to go through all the details here. Uh, you will get a copy, but um, I want to point out a couple of things that were interesting. First of all, a transportation benefit for unskilled workers is the most important benefit. It's not only very common, as you can see from this graph, it's also the most important. The unskilled workers typically cannot afford uh, a vehicle to drive themselves to work. Public transit is, is often inefficient and, and may not be available. So employer paid transportation and the quality of that transportation is a very important benefit to unskilled workers they will change jobs in order to improve their transportation situation. So it's very important to pay attention to. It's important for employers to, to uh, put some value on that benefit. The next one, which is important for both unskilled and uh, skilled workers, is food coupons. Uh, food coupons are a program that the Mexican government has where they allow employers to pay their employees food coupons, which are used like food stamps, uh, can be redeemed at grocery stores and places like Walmart for, for food items. And uh, the benefit of the food coupon program is that to the employee, they're not taxable income, so their income without tax. And to the employer, there's a special deduction for food coupons, so it's attractive from both the employer and the employee perspective as a, as a, uh, a way to, uh, to provide a benefit. There is a ceiling on how much can be provided tax-free, um, but in general, food coupons are a very popular benefit. Now, a couple that I want to mention that are relatively unpopular. First of all, uh, life insurance is relatively unpopular with unskilled workers. And the reason is pretty obvious. Uh, these people are, are living close to the line in many cases. And uh, so uh, something that doesn't deliver a benefit today um, it, it is not necessarily something that they put much value on. Now, you'll notice there seem to be a number of companies providing it, however, and uh, the reason for that is that many companies with their unskilled workers will provide some minimal amount of life insurance to cover funeral expenses. Uh, some will also self-insure that expense. And, and the reason for that is uh, to, um, to show the caring side of the employer and, and concern for the family um, in the case that someone does pass away uh, to make sure that they have a decent funeral. So that's, that's where unskilled workers get life insurance. For skilled workers, uh, much in the higher pay brackets, it's much like the United States. Life insurance is a valuable benefit. Uh, and, and is much more like the United States where it's uh, meant as an income replacement for the family. Um, subsidized cafeteria is the other one I want to mention. You probably have heard many places that you, you have to provide food services for employees. In certain markets and in certain neighborhoods, you do because it's, it's the standard for that neighborhood. Uh, Tijuana, for example, it's pretty much the standard. Uh, so you're, you're probably going to be in that situation. If you're next door to General Motors, you're probably going to need to do it. Um, or if you're somewhere where it's not easy to get food products uh, to, you know, a remote area, uh, then you might. Uh, but it's not generally necessary. And you can see that two of these markets uh, in this graph, Hermosillo and Saltillo, have very low levels of subsidized cafeterias. Now, uh, from an employee, the reason is from an employee perspective, it's not particularly popular. It's always a copay. So that means the employee is paying some sum of money for the service, which many of them resent, or they don't feel they're getting value for the money. The food quality becomes an issue. Uh, there are complaints. 
it's not it's not generally a, a benefit which satisfies the employees at a high level. But on the employer side, it's a benefit that requires considerable management, not only dealing with the complaints, but you have to provide a facility or you have to hire a service or manage it directly. Uh, so all in all, money spent on subsidized cafeteria can be a, a, a burden rather than a benefit. If you have a choice, try to put that money to something else uh, and, and provide a benefit that your employees are gonna get more out of. So those are the comments I have. There's a wide range of benefits. The only other thing I would counsel is that in whatever market you're going to operate in, find out what the benefit structure is, try to allocate your money towards the ones that have higher value, but you wanna make sure you're competitive or you, or you won't attract and retain employees. Uh, there's an employee severance pay law in Mexico. There is no unemployment insurance, uh, but there, if you terminate an employee other than for cause, and cause is very limited, the law defines uh, six or seven different items which, are, um, which qualify as cause. And they include things like violence in the workplace, intoxication, that kind of thing, uh, but they don't include performance. So if an employee doesn't leave of their own accord and they they aren't terminated for cause, then the employer is going to have to pay severance. Now, um, the the uh, cost of severance uh, typically ranges in the one and a half to three percent of payroll range, so not dissimilar from unemployment insurance costs in a lot of market markets that you know end up paying into government unemployment insurance programs. Um, but it is a cost that needs to be managed, and it can get out of control. So. The severance entitlement occurs the day the employee starts with the employer. And if that employee is terminated, they immediately get 90 days pay at their most recent wage. In addition, they're entitled to 12 days pay per year of service, but this 12 days is limited at up at twice the minimum wage, which is generally not a very big amount. And then in addition to that, there's a 20 day entitlement per year of service at their most recent wage. So you can see by the graph on the left hand side of the screen here that, that it can mount up quickly as the employee's seniority increases. Um, so you can understand in Mexico, there's an, an adage that you hire slowly and fire quickly because things don't get better uh, as time goes on. Another thing to remember is that Mexico does not have a temporary layoff law. So there's no, no provision for temporary layoff and recall of employees. If you lay an employee off and they're a full-time employee, they're entitled to severance. Uh, there are some ways to mitigate some of that, and there's, there's a contract provision to allow you to hire people for an evaluation period. But the important point to take away from this is, first of all, that there is an expense here that you should budget for. It's not, it, if it's well managed, it's not significant, but it does need to be budgeted for. And secondly, this is something that does need to be managed. The real estate market in, in Mexico is relatively similar to the United States, except that uh, lease rates there are generally quoted in square foot per month, uh, but they're generally triple net as they are in a lot of other real estate markets. Uh, they're also typically quoted in US dollars. Majority of landlords prefer to have their lease rate in, um, in, in uh, US dollars rather than, uh, uh, rather than in um, in pesos, but that's not true of all landlords. Uh, you can see by the yellow numbers here, which are the average rates for each of these markets. So there's some variation in markets. You can see down in Manzanillo, uh, which is not an industrialized area, that it's it's cheaper, much cheaper than it is up in Tijuana, which is of course right on the border. But uh, like in most other markets, within a market, the rates vary much more than they do between cities. Uh, generally speaking, you're getting a bare building. Uh, which probably is going to need some leasehold improvements. So uh, when you're calculating your rent uh, or uh, budgeting your rent, you need to allow not only for the TMI, uh, which will be added to the base rate, but at least some level of leasehold improvements. Another thing is that uh, in Mexico, you may well encounter landlords that are not willing to amortize any or very few leasehold improvements. So in some cases, you may be faced with, with coming up with the cash. Other landlords will amortize almost anything into the rent. So um, for our, our design, we're, their situation, they, they're in the Saltillo market. They, they've got an average rent of 40 cents. They're going to assume that at the average level, they can, they can find a building that suits them. Uh, their TMI is, is in the midpoint of the range. Usually TMI ranges from one and a half to three and a half cents. Uh, by the way, it's not called TMI in Mexico. 
uh, but it amounts to the same thing. One of the reasons it isn't is that often insurance in Mexico uh, is a responsibility of the lessee, but you have to prove to the landlord that you're carrying it. Uh, but anyway, that's, it amounts to the same, a similar kind of concept. And lastly, uh, our design needs a few leasehold improvements and ventilation, lighting upgrades, things like that, that the landlord's willing to amortize into the rain. At the end of the day, they're at 46 cents. Power in Mexico. Uh, the Mexican government has been in the process of deregulating power since 2013. Uh, and, uh, and there has been significant deregulation. That has resulted in lower prices for power. Uh, the, the rates have been declining for some time in Mexico. Uh, but the current administration, uh, they're facing midterm elections shortly, and uh, the uh, president has indicated in Mexico uh, that, he's, that he may consider rolling back the deregulation, that he would like to do that. Now, he can't just do that on his own. He needs the support of the states because it actually requires some constitutional changes. Uh, but the point of all this is there is some uncertainty about where the power market is going in Mexico. If they do go back to regulation and allow the national utility to regain their monopoly, rates may rise again. It's, it's not, uh, not at all clear at this point in time. Today, our clients are averaging uh, 9.4 cents per kilowatt hour. Um, that's a blend of different times of use and different demand curves and so on. Uh, but but that's uh, typically where our clients are averaging. And you can see that uh, the average in, in Mexico in general for medium power users is 9.6 cents per kilowatt hour. Uh, and that compares very favorably with a lot of other American cities that are, um, that are listed there as well as uh, some Canadian ones. Um, so our design looks at this and because of the uncertainty, they're gonna budget on the, on the higher end, certainly in phase one where they only have daytime use they're going, to, they're going to budget at a higher level. Uh, but as they add uh, different shifts, uh, second and third shift, and they change their time of use, they figure that rate <clears throat> is going to decline. So you can see that they've dropped it a little bit each, with each phase. Water in Mexico is generally cheap, uh, but it can be restricted supply in some areas. And that's usually not the availability of water. It's often the distribution network itself. So um, pays to make sure that you have adequate water supply if you're a process water user. Industrial users are prioritized, but if the distribution can't deliver the water, uh, you're not going to get it. So um, in fact, what you're looking at in that picture is our desalination plant at our Empalme Industrial Park on the West Coast. Uh, and in that particular city, uh, if we didn't have that desalination plant and we're desalinating our own water, our industrial users would, would not have an adequate supply. So uh, just depending on where you are, make sure you check into that and make sure that you've actually got an adequate supply. If you're just talking personal use for your employees, it, it should not be an issue. Goods and services are, are different uh, situation uh, in Mexico than you might expect. And that's because distribution costs tend to be higher. So in most North American and international brands are available. Uh, of just about every industrial uh, component and, and uh, good that you might purchase, as well as uh, a lot of uh, things that you might consume in, in stationery and so on. But often there's a higher distribution cost in Mexico that results in a higher price. So sometimes you can find that something you can buy on the Texas side of the border at a certain price is significantly more expensive when you go to the Mexican side of the border, strictly because of the distribution costs. Uh, what you can do here is, is uh, first of all, be careful about uh, checking into what you're going to consume and what it really costs, especially if you've got something that, that you use in high volume uh, as an indirect supply. Uh, but also you do have the option of importing items directly from the United States, uh, and that may be an alternative in some cases to, to um, the cost of distribution in Mexico. Uh, but of course, on the other side of the coin, lower wages mean services are considerably less expensive in Mexico. Now, where does that wash out? Well, it depends on your particular business and your mix. Some people find they get a net savings on goods and services. Some people find they pretty much break even with what their costs are in the United States. Others find it costs a little bit more. Uh, it pays to think this through though, because um, but can, can, you can get a surprise. Taxes, uh, we've already talked about EVA. That's the value added tax. Uh, it starts at 8% uh, in some specific border regions. This is a temporary measure that was put in by the current administration. It's not clear whether it'll continue or not. It was originally for a two-year period. 
it, it may may be rolled back. Uh, but for now, there are specifically defined regions along the border where the value added tax is 8%. In the rest of Mexico, it's 16%. Uh, it applies to almost all goods and services that you um, consume in Mexico. But it can be zero. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, if you're an Emex company and an exporter, in most cases, you either can not pay the value added tax or you can recover the value added tax. The corporate tax rate is 30%. Uh, there is a uh, safe harbor provision for uh, non-arms length companies, which is what most of you will end up being. Uh, and the safe harbor provision is that you use 6.5% of your assets in Mexico or 6.9% of your total expenditures in Mexico, and you use that as a proxy for your income and pay 30% of that. If uh, that calculation doesn't work out well and you are a non-arms length you. Uh, um, non-arms like company, uh, then the alternative is a transfer pricing agreement and that, that can be done as well. Um, Mexico has tax treaties with uh, just about everybody uh, else in the world, certainly with the United States. So taxes paid in Mexico can be deducted off your uh, US taxes or in most other countries, Canada and Germany and UK and so on. The predial is the, is the main source of, it's the real estate tax, it's the main source of income for municipalities. It ranges from 0.1 to 0.5% of assessed value. Now, you notice earlier we talked about leasing, that's because that's the most common way of um, property, uh, of, of acquiring property in Mexico for corporations. One of the reasons for that is that uh, that it's uh, in many markets, uh, the real estate is closely held and, the, and those that hold it prefer to lease and have the income rather than realize the capital. Um, so consequently, in many markets, there really isn't a lot of availability of industrial property, and what is available is, is a relatively high price. Uh, that's not true of every market. Uh, and even in those markets, if you choose to buy property, you can. So you might, uh, you might choose to own your own building, in which case you'll pay the real estate tax directly. Otherwise, uh, probably your landlord will collect it from you as part of the TMI. The state payroll tax is the main source of revenue for the states. It is applied to the cost of your payroll, uh, and it ranges, depending on the state, from 1.8 to 2.9%, uh, depending on where you're located. Now, Emex avoids EVA. We already talked about that. The predial and the state tax might be delayed or deferred. Uh, there have been incentive programs that will delay or defer the predial or the state tax. However, um, not, not talking lately because COVID kind of turns everything upside down, uh, but prior to the COVID situation, Mexico was, was not uh, giving uh, significant incentives in most cases. Uh, there were some incentives for training, there were some incentives for startup in some cases, uh, but bottom line, they weren't significant, uh, they weren't that easy to get anymore, and uh, unless you're a really large um, investor, gonna hire an awful lot of people, uh, it's unlikely to be a, a deciding factor in your choice. It doesn't mean you shouldn't ask. It doesn't mean you shouldn't take advantage of what's there, but it's unlikely to, to define your choice of where you locate in Mexico. Uh, talking about some uh, one, uh, one-time costs, um, I, uh, I'm gonna start with the electrical demand capacity. Uh, and that's uh, a one-time charge of $100 approximately US, it's actually in pesos, per KVA. So if your demand is more than 200 KVAs, you may need to, to pay this demand charge. Whatever you pay, is, it's one time, you own that demand forever, uh, but you may need to pay that, that charge. An environmental study is required for all new factories, uh, ranges $1,500 to $5,000 US for a third-party consultant to um, evaluate your environmental streams and, and your control methods, and, and uh, that gets submitted to the government for approval. Uh, utility bonds are typically required. Uh, CFE, the electrical utility, requires one, and they, they don't negotiate out of it. Uh, but uh, telecoms often ask for them, and um, sometimes you can negotiate them away. Um, but uh, in other cases, they're gonna be required. Incorporation costs, um, of course, they can range widely, uh, but $5,000 US uh, is, is not an uncommon cost, um, maybe a bit more depending on your, your complexity. If you do multiple corporations at once, uh, you'll probably get each one less, 
there certainly are uh, competent uh, lawyers and accountants who can incorporate you for relatively little money in Mexico. <clears throat> and uh, as I said earlier, you can incorporate as many companies as you want. Electrical certification. Now, this one isn't a significant cost. Uh, you do need to pay an electrical engineer for certification of your drawings, uh, and then you need to submit them to the utility. The big thing here is time. Uh, a lot of people leave this way too late. You need to uh, submit a drawing which identifies your loads and, and uh, your electrical plan. That needs to go to the engineer to be evaluated and, and certified, and that takes time. And then it needs to get submitted to the utility, and they take a lot of time to evaluate and review it. And you can't turn on your power until you've got all of that. <clears throat> uh, fire system certification is, is relatively inexpensive, but you do need a training plan, and you need to maintain a, a trained fire force in your organization. A um, couple things that vary widely, utility connection fees. In a lot of cases uh, where you have a build to suit or, um, or a property that you've acquired yourself, you, you'll need to connect the utilities and that might be significant depending on where you need to run them from and whether you need substations and so on. Uh, if you're dealing with an industrial park uh, where you're, you're renting a building that already exists or that's uh, being built, you probably won't need to pay it, but make sure you check into it. Furniture and fittings, of course, varies widely. I mention it because some people kind of forget about this. Um, and uh, if you haven't started a new facility in a while, uh, you, may, you may not uh, fully realize how much you actually need in order to get a facility up and running. But, um, but it, you know, it depends on each user. Uh, the, uh, the last one is the leasehold improvements. And we talked about that earlier. Um, I just want to reemphasize that uh, they're bare buildings generally. Uh, and uh, you will need to um, make some leasehold improvements in almost all cases, and the landlord may not amortize all or any of those leasehold improvements. So it's important to sort that out. Um, so uh, if we look at the case of art design, you can see they, they've uh, budgeted in each one of these categories. They do, in fact, need more electrical power. Uh, and uh, they budgeted each of these other areas. Their total one-time cash investment, including $40,000 of police holds their landlord isn't expected to amortize, uh, is, is $91,000. Okay, uh, let's talk now about the actual cost estimate for um, our design. As I mentioned, we're, we're only gonna talk about the factory costs here. Uh, we're not gonna deal with raw materials and we're not gonna deal with um, uh, <clears throat> any of the uh, um, SG&A costs, uh, but let's let's go into uh, Art Design's plan again and refresh our memory. So the three phases, one facility throughout, they're going to start at 21 direct and five indirect. They work their way up to 75, 72 direct, and, and they work, have 12 indirect at that level. Uh, and they're in Saltillo with a shelter. So what we've got here is at 22 and a half pesos exchange rate, we've got their hourly cost per direct labor hour. So across the top, you can see the direct labor hours that work out with each of these shifts and the number of heads that they've got. Uh, and of course, each of those shifts, as we said earlier, has different uh, number of weekly hours in the same pay rate, different number of hours worked. And you can see that the direct labor rate there ranges from 318 up to 338 per hour. There's a bit of a shift because of hours and there's a bit of a shift because of the mix of workers that they have. And now that rate includes all of the fringes and all of the government benefits. That's an all-in rate for each hour that they work. Down below that, we've got the indirect and salary. Now in this case, it's, it's not what the indirect and salary are paid on an hourly basis, it's per direct labor hour. And of course, what we see here is as they increase their size and spread their overheads, it drops from 262 to 169. The building likewise, as they make better use of that building and produce more, their, their per direct labor hour rate drops. And then we have the grab bag of other overhead costs. This is their utilities, their telecommunications, their goods and services, all of the other things that they need uh, at that factory level to make their um, operation go, parts and maintenance and so on. Uh, and that goes from, from 576 and becomes 550 in phase three. There's a bit of a shift in each level depending on the mix of items that they need and the power level that they require in the model that we did. Lastly, we have their logistics and freight and that shifts around a bit. Now, in this case, this is all of their logistics and freight. Obviously, when they compare this 
to their uh, Chinese cost for a finished good, they're going to have to take a landed cost because they've got to they've got to add a logistics and freight to that as well. But you can see that there is a shift as as they bring goods from China and as they eventually then start sourcing from Mexico, they drop back down again in that that freight rate um, in their particular plan. And the bottom line is that they're they're making uh, that they're in the phase one. They have a, a cost of seventeen dollars and sixty-seven U.S. direct per hour. Now they're going to need to add to this their um, raw materials. They're going to need to add their SG&A, any amortization and depreciation, to get to their full all-in cost. But this is what their factory cost is, and that cost decreases to fourteen dollars and thirty-one cents for direct labor hour for phase three. Now everybody's going to be different. Uh, we have clients ranging all over the place. This is a fairly typical number, maybe a bit on the high side uh, for some clients, um, but but each client is going to be different and, and each industry is going to be different, but you get, can see where the cost is going here. And for art design, this compares favorably with their Chinese costs. Now I'm showing you the same thing, uh, but annualized at, per month and then annualized at the bottom. So um, in phase one, uh, it's about a million dollars a year, just shy of a million dollars a year. And by phase three, their cost, their factory cost is up to 2.4 million for their operation. Now, I want to go through some uh, common mistakes and uh, some of the most frequently missed or underestimated costs that, that can cause problems. And this is drawn from our client base. The first uh, and perhaps surprising one is logistics. Um, and this usually comes from over-optimism. Um, assuming that you know we're going to have one trailer every six weeks and that's going to have everything on it uh, from this this particular source and then finding out that no we're shipping every week and it's it's less than truckload shipments obviously the transaction cost goes up the the cost of freight goes up and sometimes this gets uh, gets fairly significant and, and out of control so it's important to be realistic about uh, what you're really going to have to ship and the quantities that you're going to need to ship um, in order to get the facility off uh, and, and up and running. Raw material, uh, the usual issue here is, is um, making assumptions about the availability of raw material or the landed cost. Uh, one of the mistakes people make is that they find out that a raw material can be procured in Mexico, imported into Mexico without uh, a duty or tariff but then that their export market, whether it be the United States or one of the other free trade zones that Mexico can export to, won't allow that particular good to travel through without a tariff. So that's, that's a potential pitfall. The second one is specifications. Yes, there's steel available in Mexico. Yes, there's aluminum available in Mexico. But is it in the specification that you require? Perhaps not. Uh, and so it's important to uh, make sure that you can get the raw material that you want and what the landed cost is really going to be, and to do that tariff analysis if you're uh, if you're importing. If you're in NAFTA or the USMCA zone, and all your goods are are coming from that zone, you don't need to worry about it. But if you're but if you're importing from outside, and most people will be, uh, or exporting outside, then the tariff situation can start to get complicated. It's a good idea to check into it. Computer and IT equipment is not so much the cost of the equipment; um, it's the it's the potential disruption from having not thought through a, an IT strategy that works. And primarily this has to do with MRP systems and scheduling systems, communication with the home office. Most, if not all people, choose some kind of a, a home server method with an internet connection to Mexico. That, that certainly works well in many cases. It's not, uh, unless you're very large down there, it's not necessary to install your own servers and software. Um, but you have to make sure that that's uh, properly trained and you have to make sure that the communication is in Spanish. So if it hasn't been thought through well, people resolve this problem obviously when they realize it, but you don't want that at your launch. So we see, we see that uh, happen occasionally. Um, furniture and signage, I, I mentioned earlier, it's, uh, it's easy to miss things. Uh, and when you're trying to launch to find out that you've got desks and no chairs, that kind of thing. Uh, so uh, starting early enough uh, to get the deliveries and making sure you've covered all of the, the items you're going to need uh, can, can avoid a lot of disruption at startup and launch uh, that can cost money. And we've had people run into some fairly significant disasters there. Uh, indirect expenses, we already talked about. Again, this is just a matter of checking uh, on any of the components that you're buying in significant numbers and being aware that um, that you are going to potentially face higher costs for some distributed items in Mexico, uh, whereas you're likely to save money 
on goods and services. Um, but thinking through this, um, the other thing I find is that, and, and I'm guilty of this myself, when I was um, planning Mexico, as a, as a president or an operations manager, I don't often, didn't often uh, look at the, the detail of my indirect expenses. So it's easy to forget categories when you're going down a list that's stationary. Oh yeah, it's about the same as last month. Safety supplies, oh yeah, it looks about the same as last month. Uh, but when you're aggregating all of that, uh, the complexity increases and, and the risk of something becoming more costly uh, starts to increase. So it, it's good to just sort of go through what really are, are all those components going to be and, and to do some uh, zero-based budgeting on it when you're, when you're setting up your facility. Travel and accommodations. Um, this, this also is an area where over-optimism can be a problem. Um, if, you, if you assume you're not going to be sending people or not going to be sending people very often to Mexico, that's probably not right in the first year. Um, the, just the nature of things I mentioned earlier, that, that tribal knowledge that you don't have uh, in, in, uh, in, in your new facility, uh, that, that's got to, be, um, got to be conveyed. And uh, consequently, uh, people will be traveling back and forth uh, and uh, thinking through how that, how frequent that's going to be, what the the most comfortable and most cost-effective way to deliver it uh, can have benefits. So, for example, you, do you rent a service department? Uh, that might be a good idea. Do you use a driving service, or do you uh, do you buy a car? Um, the, there's a bunch of options there that can make a difference, both in terms of cost and how uh, how uh, easy it is for your staff to be traveling back and forth and spending time in, in Mexico. The most important one, training. Um, you're starting a new facility. Uh, no one there knows anything about your corporate culture or any of the tribal knowledge that you've got. And no matter how well documented you are and, and how um, well organized your processes are, it's gonna be difficult to get that up and running. And you need to think that through with your training you need to put the, the effort into training that can be repeated by the facility. And most importantly, you need to have training in Spanish. The, the plant manager will probably speak excellent English. Uh, the receptionist will probably speak excellent English. And probably your engineers will speak English. And the rest will not. So um, a training program that they can manage and that's, um, that's efficient is, is extremely important. So what do you do if this looks good to you? Well, you decide what gateway works for you. It, it might be the same as art design, or it might be contract manufacturing, or it might be acquisition. It might be some other gateway. Um, then you think about locations, as, as we did, uh, in order to narrow things down. Mexico's big country, lots of different places to go. You make your task easier if you, if you narrow it down to one or two or maybe three locations that look, look attractive to you. Then decide what support you need. And, and I can't emphasize enough that Getting some support will, will certainly help make your, um, your entry into Mexico and even your evaluation of Mexico much easier and, and uh, much more accurate. It, the, the cousin of your brother-in-law's sister's friend is not going to be the guy you want to talk to. Might be a good guy to have on your team, but it's unlikely that that, that person, he or she, has, has started multiple plants in multiple industries and knows what, what you need to be doing. Um, there are people, uh, obviously shelters are, are one area you can go to, uh, but there are consultants out there, there are accountants, there are uh, legal firms, um, there's some government help, there are associations, lots of people out there who have a lot of knowledge about what you need to do and um, tapping into them will help make things uh, much easier when you actually launch. Um, then you're ready to estimate your operating costs. Again, you probably need some help getting those costs, uh, but uh, the same group of people can help you get the costs and get a, get a reliable estimate. And then you're ready to plan a visit to Mexico. Well, maybe not right now with COVID, but, uh, but soon we hope we're all gonna be through this. And, um, and if you do all these other things, then when you go to Mexico, you're armed with the information that will allow you to question other people who are doing what you're doing and to look at the alternatives uh, with a critical eye and hopefully uh, decide that you are going to invest in, and have a successful operation there. How can we help? Uh, we can help with site selection, cost analysis. We can help you identify and develop a supply chain. We can provide boots on the ground for project management. Those are all prior to you launching. When you launch, we can also help your operation. We can be your human resource department. We can be your import export department. We can help with regulatory compliance 
and we can help with your logistics. And all of those things we can do, whether you choose the shelter option or whether you choose to be a standalone company. Shelter companies in general can, can provide services to any company, whether it's incorporated independently or not. So regardless of what your choice is, uh, those services are available from us. That's, that's everything I have for today. Um, let's see if we have some questions we can answer here. Just before I, I uh, look at uh, whether we have any questions, um, I do want to, uh, to mention that you, you have a copy of this. You have my contact information on here. Uh, please reach out to me if you have questions. If you think of them tomorrow or a week from now, um, please feel free to reach out to me and, and I'll do my best to answer them. And for those that we've gone past the hour, but for those that want to hang in, I'll just uh, see if there are some questions I can answer here. Um, and uh, uh, just looking at the list here. Um, don't see any. Oh, uh, there's a question uh, here about security. Um, let me answer that. Um, the, the security situation in Mexico is, um, is first of all, it, as everyone knows, is primarily a question of, of, of uh, narcotics violence. And uh, the narcotics violence tends to be very localized. It tends to be very targeted. Uh, many areas of Mexico have, have really very little or none uh, of the activity. And it tends to be in areas where most uh, foreign people are not going to go. So as a foreigner, you're not going to be targeted. Um, you're, you're not likely to go and, and you shouldn't go uh, into areas where violence is high. So the likelihood is you're, you're not going to have any exposure to it at all. Now, the border zones have a higher level of, of security problems, not just from um, narcotics violence, but obviously there's uh, human trafficking going on there and there's immigration issues and there are other things as transients. Uh, so they are definitely a higher level of, of risk along the border. Uh, but in general, uh, in Mexico, it's possible to be in very secure areas. Um, and our clients um, have not experienced in any of our parks, um, any violence uh, related to any of these issues. Um, some of them have had experience of, of issues at the border, uh, but nothing serious. So um, that, that's, that's the most I can say. I, I guess uh, I would also refer people, if you want a better understanding of violence, uh, the University of San Diego annually publishes a, um, a security report on Mexico. And that gives you a much better understanding of what, what actually is going on down there, uh, where it goes on, and, and where the risks are. I think that's the only question we have right now. Um, I don't see any more. So if, if anybody um, thinks of a question, please contact us. Uh, we'll do our best to answer it. And thank you very much for joining us today.